Hello, I'm Leslie Rush from Laval University at the Center of Optics, Photonics and Lasers, and within that, the Optical Communications Laboratory. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to speak to you today about designing silicon photonic systems for high-speed networks. Let me also acknowledge my co-authors, my uh, former PhD students, Hassan Saparian and Sassan Zalampour, former postdoc, Jashwan Lin, and my colleague, Professor Wei Shi. I'll start today to talk to you a little bit about why it's important to have a system level and component level co-design for a silicon modulator. I'll start by discussing the uh, pulse amplitude modulation and proposing a figure of merit for the use of on-off keying, OOK, and PAM modulation. And in order to develop this figure of merit, I'll go over a performance, uh, a modulator performance penalty uh, figure. Having done with the uh, PAM modulation, I'll go on to talk about complex modulation formats such as QAM or quadrature amplitude, amplitude modulation, and how we can use the same uh, modulator performance penalty uh, in order to design uh, modulators for these complex uh, formats, and in particular, the design trade-offs that we're going to have to do for QAM. Finally, I'll end my talk with a discussion about a demonstration of one terabit per second modulation uh, using the uh, silicon modulator we designed uh, using this methodology. So silicon modulators offer low cost, low power, highly integrated systems. And they're becoming, uh, the modulators are a key component in developing entirely all silicon, silicon photonic uh, solutions. There are many varieties of modulators. And in particular, I'll be talking today about traveling wave Moxander modulators. Uh, this is our focus because they offer very wide band operation, thermal insensitivity. So here I have uh, sort of a typical design for a Moxender uh, modulator. And there are many uh, device level parameters that we have to choose in designing our um, modulator. There are many process constraints, what we're allowed to do with our parameters. There are some reference designs, sort of some standard ways of, of doing a modulator design. And there are some special enhancements we can do to this design for RF and optical velocity matching, et cetera, and other things. Now, contrast this with system level, where we're going to take this modulator that's designed, and we're going to use it with a particular modulation format, targeting a specific baud rate and a, a certain driving voltage. For instance, we might want to uh, keep our driving voltage down to two volts in order to make it compatible, compatible with the CMOS drive. So somehow these two approaches, a device level parameter choice, a system level design, it should be combined to come up with a final design that will allow us to optimize the performance of our modulator within a system. In order to achieve that, we need some sort of figure of merit that can help us uh, drive through to this, this design. Now, when we use traveling waves in silicon uh, photonics, uh, there are some differences with other um, materials that we might use. And in particular with sil silicon, there is high loss that we have to deal with. And there is also something known as the plasma dispersion effect. And this means that when I apply uh, reverse voltage uh, to the modulator, the um, change in the effective index is going to have a nonlinear response to that voltage, which is unusual, which is not what we find with other materials. In addition, this means if we take this variation of the effective index with applied voltage. That means that the phase change that we're going to uh, get from the modulator is also going to be nonlinear in the applied voltage. Again, something different from other modulators. Note also in here that the phase change is related to the length L of the modulator. And there is a, when we try to change the modulator length, it has complex behavior with what effect that has on the VPI of the modulator and the bandwidth of the modulator. Final complication is that the bias voltage that we choose for operation will also have an impact on VPI. And it's related to this uh, nonlinear um, relationship between the effective index uh, difference and the applied reverse voltage. So it's sort of described in, in these equations. So what we uh, set out to do was to find a silicon photonic figure of merit that takes into account 
when I change the length of my modulator, I'm changing the extinction ratio, I'm changing the bandwidth, and I'm changing the achievable voltage swing. Now, at the same time, I'm taking a systems view and I'm going to look at what is the modulation format that I want to achieve. And in particularly in this part of the talk, I'm going to focus on multi-level modulation, such as PAM or pulse amplitude modulation. So what I'm trying to do is find a figure of merit that lets me optimize the phase shifter length L, which will, of course, impact all of these uh, factors in the modulator performance. So to put these in perspective, what I've plotted here is the uh, response of the modulator to the input voltage change. And of course, here we have Vpi which lets us, the voltage that lets us go through a, few, a full uh, pi um, phase shift. First thing we notice is there's an optical loss, which of course is important in the uh, silicon photonics, and that will uh, uh, um, impact the modulation efficiency. There's also uh, modulation loss, which is based on my RF voltage compared to my V pi. So the relative values of these are going to determine uh, which region of this response I'm going to be operating in, and this com uh, contributes to uh, modulation loss. Finally, there's something that I can't really show on this graph alone, and that is the, um, limit, the, effect, the impact of limited bandwidth on a, a multi-level um, modulation format. And in particularly, a limited bandwidth is going to lead to what we call intersymbol interference. And we can see this in this eye diagram that's plotted for PAM, in this case, uh, four level PAM, there's four discrete levels that are there. If we had infinite um, bandwidth, there would be uh, what we call an eye opening, which would be the full distance between these uh, discrete levels. However, because of the limited bandwidth, then we have these uh, traces that you see here, and we can see that the eye opening is actually uh, much less than the separation between these uh, different modulation rails, as we call them. And this reduction in eye opening gives us a power uh, penalty. So what we do is we define this modulator power penalty, which is a combination of all three of these effects. One is due to optical loss. One is due to a uh, limited extinction ratio. So uh, this is, and the last one is due to the uh, bandwidth constraints. So if I were going to plot here now, what is this power penalty compared to the length that I might choose? Suppose we ignored the third factor, which is the bandwidth constraint. I would get a um, plot that looks something like this, which gives me the impression that the longer my modulator, the better my performance, the smaller my penalty will be. However, when I add the impact of intersymbol interference, the impact of having a limited bandwidth, uh, the change in the uh, power penalty is significant. And we can see instead of being better to just go to longer and longer modulators, in fact, there is a sweet spot, an optimal point, where we can uh, pick the length of our uh, modulator. Now this trace was for a particular bandwidth um, target, excuse me, a particular uh, baud rate target. So uh, what I've done here is I've changed the plot to show you the length versus the bandwidth that can be achieved. So this means that the shorter the uh, modulator, the higher bandwidth I'm going to, I can achieve. And as I go to longer, my bandwidth is getting lower. So now suppose that I plot my power penalty, but for various different target baud rates. So it's not surprising that if I'm targeting a baud rate that's very low, 14 gigabaud, then uh, any length is going to be uh, good and there's no real intersymbol inter interference that impacts me. However, if I go to very high baud rates, 112 gigabaud, in that case, uh, we can see that um, the shorter um, uh, lengths are, are going to be favored because I'm getting higher bandwidth with these uh, shorter lengths. So this um, power penalty gives us a feeling for how baud rate is going to change what was going to be my optimal choice for the length of my modulator. So we came up with a figure of merit that would help us uh, evaluate this uh, trade-off. And in this figure of merit, we're going to be focusing on a few system parameters that we're going to let push into the choice of the device parameters, in particular the length of the modulator. So what I'm going to be looking at is this ratio of the bandwidth of the modulator divided by the baud rate that I'm trying to achieve. And so this is a figure of how hard I'm pushing 
um, the device in order to get higher performance. And of course, it's also going to depend on how many modulation levels I have. The more modulation levels I have, the more severe the ISI will be. So here is the uh, final figure of merit that we use, and we can uh, see that it has a very simple form, closed form solution. Uh, what we do is we uh, fix an L, and of course L will uh, change the bandwidth of the modulator and the VPI of the modulator. But once we change that L, we calculate what the VPI is and the bandwidth for the uh, modulator. Then we come up with what is a figure of merit. So first thing we did was to test, and is this figure of merit actually predicting the uh, modulator power penalty? And so here in the solid line is the uh, figure of merit. So this is just the closed form solution. And then in the dotted line, there's some Monte Carlo simulations that we did where we just uh, uh, ran a uh, simulation and measured what was the, in fact, the power penalty. And you can see that the optimal lengths uh, of the modulator coincide. And this was for a particular baud rate, but we uh, ran these simulations for many different baud rates, and we can see that the minima for our figure of merit coincides with what really minimizes the uh, modulator power penalty. Some of you might be very quick and say, hey, Leslie, look over there. Uh, looks fine in these three points, but on that other one, looks like your optimal points are different between this uh, figure of merit and the power penalty. And I'd say, you know, you're right. They are different. However, even though the uh, optimal point, I might choose six, and the uh, true optimal, I might choose 6.375, and the true optimal might be at six. But let's look, when I make this slightly off choice, it's going to have very little impact on the uh, power penalty because these two uh, curves are very shallow at this point. So I hope this has convinced you that our power penalty um, measure is being reflected in our figure of merit, which is a nice closed form, easy to sweep. Now I'd like to switch gears and go into a two-dimensional modulation format, QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. So we had our design tool for PAM, which was a figure of merit. However, the figure of merit der derivation is too simple to apply to a two-dimensional a modulation format such as QAM. So our goal now is to adapt the PAM modulator power penalty uh, to a two-dimensional constellation. So to try and take this idea of defining a power penalty and using that and to somehow come up with a design tool. So we're going to uh, look at this two-dimensional constellation. And so when we look at a two-dimensional constellation in I and Q in phase and quadrature, we see here an example for 16 QAM where we have 16 points on this two-dimensional plane. Now, normally there is some minimal distance, capital D here, which defines how well separated these uh, points of the constellation are. And the more separated they are, the better the performance. So what we're going to do now is we're going to fix a, a certain length and a certain fabrication process, and we're going to create a numerical model for this modulator. So whereas before we had a closed form solution for figure of merit, now we're going into a uh, numerical simulator of the uh, power penalty. So we just do Monte Carlo transmissions of QAM data, and we look at what is the constellation diagram looking after going through the silicon modulator. So what do we expect to find? Well, first of all, because of the optical loss, of course, the points will not be as far a point, uh, apart as they could be uh, due to this parameter alpha, which is the loss. Next, we expect to see some modulation loss, the fact that our uh, RF voltage might be much lower than our VPI, for instance, if we're trying to uh, modulate it at uh, two volts uh, swing. And then finally, we'll also have the effect of intersymbol interference. And intersymbol interference is going to uh, create uh, clouds around those uh, points that have been brought more together. So all of these effects taken together mean that the separation between points in the constellation is going to be greatly reduced. And now this minimum distance we'll call a small d. And what we propose is that the ratio of the new smaller minimal distance to the larger minimal distance is going to be proportional to this uh, penalties that we defined earlier with PAM. And so now when we do our digital uh, simulations, we're going to be looking at this ratio and using that 
as our modulator power penalty. So no more closed form solution. In this case, it's strictly Monte Carlo simulations. So uh, recall that the um, phase shift is um, nonlinear in the applied voltage, and in particular, that the V bias here, the bias voltage we choose is going to have an impact on this power penalty. So we're going to assume in these simulations that I'm showing you, 60 gigawatt operation, 16 quam, that we're using the two volt RF swing. And I'm going to look at different choices of bias voltage and what impact that has on the performance. So here we have length of our modulator, that's what we're looking for, and the power penalty. And this is for the choice of uh, minus 0.25 volts. Now if I go to minus 75 volts, the, the curve of the power penalty changes greatly, and we can see how it changes as I'm sweeping through different bias voltages. I can see now if I look at this that I'm going to get the smallest modulator power penalty in this case when I'm choosing this uh, bias of minus three quarter volt. So uh, I will look at uh, both optimizing the length, which is a parameter design, uh, cry, um, excuse me, which is a choice that the component designer has, what length. And I'm also going to be looking at the bias voltage, which is really what the systems engineer uh, gets to choose as the operating point. So we can see this as sort of joint system and uh, component optimization. So um, just to recall that um, optical designs will vary widely with the operating point. So choosing the operating point is very important. So as I said, in this case, we went and designed a and had fabricated a modulator with about four and a half millimeter um, phase shifter length. And um, we're going to show you some results of uh, we achieved experimentally uh, using this modulator, which we had. Uh, fabricated. So this is a photograph of the modulator that we had fabricated and we characterized it at various bias voltages to measure the frequency response. And as we can see, the frequency response varies with bias voltage and therefore the 3 dB bandwidth of the modulator varies with the bias voltage. So it's uh, not surprising that we should offer optimize this point uh, as well as the design length. So we ran a transmission experiment, and in this just transmission experiment, we measured what was the bit error rate when using various bias voltages. And what I'd like to point out to you is that if we look at the bit error rate floor that eventually we, we achieved for different bias voltages, that indeed we follow the same qualitative performance that we had in our simulator. In other words, the very best uh, bit error rate was achieved indeed with minus 0.75 volts. Of course, we made our choice here to have a four and a half millimeter length uh, modulator. So if we look at the blue, the blue would be worse than the red and the yellow at uh, the bias of minus three volts would be uh, again worse. And that is indeed the uh, performance that we saw in our experiments. So we uh, tried running uh, various baud rates and uh, for uh, the same design. And we can see how the performance varies uh, depending on what system choice we make and what's being targeted. So finally, let me just end my talk by looking at one of our uh, more recent demonstrations of what exactly we could achieve with this modulator when we go by beyond just the design, but also we do some optimization in the systems level uh, after the design is made. So recall that uh, we had this uh, different performance with different bias voltages. And uh, of course, the bandwidth and the VPI are intricately uh, related. And uh, this uh, bandwidth increases with the bias. So it's even these three parameters, which taken together, uh, give very uh, different performance uh, in our modulator. And in fact, uh, the choice of bias voltage was optimized again uh, before we did any uh, transmission. So we take our silicon photonic mock sender modulator, which has been optimized for V bias. And the first thing we do is we compensate for the low pass nature of the silicon photonic modulator by putting into some optical pre-emphasis. So we can see here, 
that we use um, an optical bandpass filter, which has gain at higher frequencies, in order to sort of to try and flatten out the response of the silicon modulator. Now, to that, we also add some digital precompensation. And in effect, we try to take what is good to do in the electrical domain, what is good to do in the optical domain, and sort of split the linear compensation around uh, uh, these two um, possibilities, taking uh, a smoother response for the analog filter and allowing any ripples to be corrected with the digital uh, version, for instance. Then we also did some nonlinear post equalization. So we used a, um, a uh, first a linear equalizer, certainly for post uh, compensation, but then we also used a nonlinear post compensator as well. In fact, and to achieve the highest performance, we had to use both a linear and a nonlinear uh, post, equal, uh, post equalization. But even with all those, we were not able to achieve the highest performance until we added a nonlinear precompensation as well. And in particularly, we used one called the iterative learning um, controlled equalizer uh, in order to, in particular, we used the ILC equalizer, uh, an iterative learning uh, method for equalization. We were able to do this for 32 QAM, which is the constellation which I'm showing to you here. So this is the um, experimental setup that we used for our experiment. And as you can see, we used polarization emulation, which meant we were able to do a dual polarization um, demonstration. And we have here our uh, pre-compensation in the digital domain. We have here our optical bandpass filter, which does the optical uh, pre-compensation. And finally, all of this uh, digital signal processing um, in order to do the comp compensation at the receiver. And this green part is where we're training in uh, quasi real time our um, nonlinear pre-compensation. So uh, let me show you some results now. Uh, if we don't use this first nonlinear uh, response, we're getting a QAM here in black and 16 QAM here in blue that are not really coming below the uh, forward error correction threshold. So here in red are the two thresholds, 7% overhead and 20% overhead. And we can see that um, 16 QAM is meeting the 20%, but not the 7%. So what do we do now? This is without this um, nonlinear pre-equalization, but when we go to the preliminary, uh, the uh, pre-equalization, which is nonlinear, now we see a big improvement. So we can see that uh, now, if I just use the uh, linear uh, compensation techniques, I can get below it uh, the effect thresholds using this nonlinear. And if I add to that this nonlinear post-equalization, then I can get myself some good margin in addition to coming below the effect result. So in conclusion, we have proposed a simple closed form expression for figure of merit for PAM. Uh, we validated the efficiency of this figure of merit. We proposed uh, how a, a design methodology that uses the power penalty in order to design QAM modulators. modulators. And of course, different from the PAM, there was no figure of merit, but it relies instead on numerical simulations. Finally, this allows silicon photonics designers in both cases to include system operating point targets as part of the design uh, process. And of course, I also told you a little bit about um, uh, some of the signal processing we can do in order to really uh, achieve the most possible. So I thank you for your attention, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.